I've got a couple of questions. Number one, where are we going to be living in heaven? In one of the stars or planets? Or are we just going to be moving about back and forth in space? Uh, yeah, you know, obviously the question didn't come from a Baptist because I said we've got a mansion. But where are you going to live? Number two, are there going to be planets like the earth in heaven with animals, fishes, and so forth? Number three, I understand that we're going to be busy judging the angels, but what about after that? What are we really going to be doing in heaven? Well, that, those are good questions because, you know, we, we talk about going to heaven. And by the way, here's a, here's a series of, these are cassettes. <laughs> so many, many years ago, I addressed this subject in a series, it's called what, When We All Get to Heaven. And it's, it, it, there's, there's a DVD, so you can get a more up-to-date version of it. But uh, they're in the bookstore, and if you want six, hour, six or eight hours worth of study on these things, that series, When We All Get to Heaven, everything we have in the bookstore is on the Internet somewhere for free. I tell people that now it's on our website. This, is th th this comes from the old building on Neva Avenue, so it, it goes back about 15, 18 years. So it's not on the website at the moment, I don't think. But any of this stuff is available there. We, we do, you know, when we package it and put it together, we, we have to charge for the CDs and the casing and stuff. But uh, it's available. So, so I, I'm not going to do six hours worth of stuff tonight, okay? If you want a six-hour study, here it is. You can write and call and get, get that or look on the Internet. Most of it you can just search YouTube and, and, and somebody's put it up there. But the really, really the question, uh, th these are good questions, you know, because we all have an interest of, in, in heaven. We all think about we're going to heaven. It's our home, future home. And, uh, th but there's a lot of controversy. Some people think you're going to spend eternity on the earth, some, you know, different places. So what is it that we're going to do and what's heaven like? And, you know, are you going to, are you going to, are there mansions? I remember when I first came to Chicago, the first funeral I ever went to in Chicago, after we'd moved up here, was, uh, it was in a, uh, a friend had died, and their pastor was a, a Grace pastor who had been, uh, he'd, he'd been a professor at Grace Bible College, he'd been a pastor for about 40 years in the Grace Movement, and he's doing the funeral, and, and the first thing he did was quote John 14, in my father's house and many mansions, if it were not so, I'd go to prepare a place for you, and they, you know, they've gone to their mansions in the sky. And I'm thinking, in John 14, when he says, in my Father's house are many mansions, the Father's house is defined in John chapter 2. And before you read 14, you would have probably read 2. So in the book of John, the Father's house is the temple. And God has prepared a bunch of, there, there are rooms in the temple for the priests to live and function in. And that's what he's talking about for the apostles in the kingdom. It's not talking about some mansion on a hilltop in heaven, you know, that kind of thing. And, and we, you get a lot of theology out of song books that really aren't, aren't, aren't so good. So we're not talking about mansions in the heaven. But what are, what are we going to be doing? Are you just going to be floating around? What are you going to be doing? And, and how is it put together? And, and what's it like? Well, let's talk a little bit about what heaven's really like to so kind of get the landscape to start with. Come with me, if you will, to... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Let, let's start there. 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 12. And Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Now that third heaven that he's talking about, verse number four, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which are not lawful for man to speak. The third heaven in the Bible is the place where God lives. It's his city. It's the place where... Now, God is God. You can't limit God by time and space. But because He is God, He can manifest Himself, His presence in a particular place to manifest Himself. And He does that in a city 
that the Bible calls uh, the city of the great king, the city of God, heaven. And that city, by the way, the, the idea of building a city is God's idea. So you have the third heaven. Now, when you think about the third heaven, if you, you go with me to Genesis chapter 1, when you look at the creation in Genesis chapter 1, you, you, you start out in verse number 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, you see that word heaven is singular? If you look at chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens, plural, and earth are fin were finished. So when he starts out, there's just one heaven. Now, by the time you get finished with the six days, there are more than one. In fact, there are three. And what he does, if you go down to verse number, number um, six, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, and, and I, don't, I don't want to, this is not what I'm going to talk about, but in your Bible, the heaven and the earth, especially as they're going to be repurposed here in Genesis chapter 1, they have a shape to them. And in that shape, a shape sort of like that, the third heaven is up here where God's presence is. So that's going to be the third heaven. Verse number 2, there's a deep and it's full of water. Then he divides the water from the water, and in the midst of it he puts a firmament, which is what we call the second heaven. That's what's happening in verse 6, 7, and 8. Now if you come down to verse number 20, and God said, let the waters that bring forth abundantly the, the moving creature, that, and by the way, verse 14, God said, let there, let there be lights in the, in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day and the night, and let them, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. So what's in this firmament is what we, is what we call the starry heavens. And the earth, of course, is in here. But this, this is where the stars and all that kind of stuff are. This is the, what we call outer space. Did you just see that sent that, that thing up to Mars? Did you watch that thing land? It's the weirdest thing you ever saw. They shoot the thing there, and it comes down, and it lets out a parachute, lands that thing, and, the, and, the, and now they got a, a rover, you know, it's, it's sort of like you got these things that fly around, it's, it's weird, they can shoot that thing that far away and do all that kind of stuff, I, it's, 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 it's kind of hokey, that's what this is, the starry heavens, then you have another, another firmament, another part of the firmament, verse 20, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, And fowl that fly above the earth, notice, in the open firmament of heaven. That's the atmosphere around the earth. So a part of this, of this firmament out here is available for the birds to fly in, for you and me to live in. It's the atmosphere around the earth where we are. It's open to us. The rest of this out here, if you try to go out there, you, you won't have too much success with it because you're not, you're, your body's not made for it. You're the earth earthy. That's why Psalm 115 tells Israel that the heavens belong to the Lord. You belong on the earth. You're the earth earthy. That's where you stay. So you have those three heavens. The first heaven is the atmosphere around the earth. The second heaven is the starry world. And the third heaven is where God lives. And those three heavens have, have to do with, with just with how... How, how the universe is, create, is organized. Come with me to Colossians chapter number 1. Understand that the, the second heavens and the first heavens, as well as the first, third heaven, they are organized. This is not just a disorganized kind of willy-nilly kind of thing. When God created them, Isaiah says he created them to be inhabited. And when he created them to be inhabited, he created them to be inhabited in an organized, structural way. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. So everything that's up here in this 
starry heavens, everything that's in the earth, God created it. But notice what he created. Visible and invisible. See them, can't see them. Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Those are positions of governmental authority. Those are positions where you, where you go out and, and carry on an organized structure. Now, you know that the, you, you can read the terms. It's fascinating. He says he created these things in heaven and earth. Then he uses the same terms to describe both of them. And the reason he does that is you can understand how powers, principalities, magistrates operate on the earth. Well, if you can understand how they operate on the earth, the same terminology is used for how they operate in the, in, in the, in the invisible realm, the angelic realm. Daniel chapter number 10, if you go over there, he, he talk about the angels in heaven, and he talk about the prince of Greece, and he talk about the, the, war, the, the, the uh, uh, Gabriel trying to come down through the, through the heavens, and the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece stopping him. He's traversing from the third heaven up here down through the starry heavens, and there are governmental structures there that say, hey, where's your passport? Where's your paperwork? Now, I can't tell you that that's what the angel said. I just know that when you travel in, 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 on the earth, among the governments of the earth, that's what you have to have. You have to have paperwork, you have to have identification papers, you have to have whatever, and so forth. Well, the same kind of thinking is used to describe <coughs> the, the angelic realm. So what your Bible's doing is just trying to explain to you and show to you, you, if you can understand this, you can understand that. So when the, government, when the heavens and the earth are created, they're created with a, an organized structure to carry on the business of God in his creation. Now, when you realize that, you begin to think, well, okay, then there are things going on in the heavens that are real, just like the things going on the earth that are real. And the, the heavenly places up there, the organization that's there, is just as real as the organization that's here. Come with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 21. And, 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 and by the way, maybe I should do this right now. This question asked, this, this questioner asked, I understand that we're going to be busy judging the angels, but what about after that? Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, because that's a basic misunderstanding of what judging the angels is about. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and get Matthew chapter 19. 1 Corinthians 6 and Matthew 19. When Paul talks about judging the angels... He's not talking about an event like the judgment seat of Christ or an event like the great white throne judgment. Judging the, the word judging in the Bible does not mean to condemn. It means to be able to discern. The verse in Philippians, Paul prayed for them that their love might abound yet more and more in all knowledge and all judgment. That's not to be able to condemn things. That's to be able to discern between good and evil, between the things that are uh, more excellent. In your Bible, judgment is not an issue of just every time you sit, we're going to stand in front of a judge and be condemned. It's the issue of having the ability to have good judgment, good discernment, that kind of thing. When he talks about judging angels, he's not talking about they're going to stand in front of you and you're a judge, you're going to... You're going you get in, you get out, you're doing right, you're not. It's talking about administering, having administrative activity. Look with me at Matthew chapter 19 before we get there, verse number 28. Matthew 19, 28. Jesus is talking to his, his apostles, and he says unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, it's his kingdom, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, when they're judging the 12 tribes, that's not going to be a moment in time. That's going to be their function all through the kingdom. They're going to be the administrative leaders of the nation Israel, each one in one of the tribes. Come back with me, if you will, to Isaiah. That's going to be a time when he fulfills his purpose and promise with the nation Israel. 
Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 25. And I will turn my hand upon thee, and purely purge away thy dross, and take away all thy tin, and I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. After thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Their counselors, their, ju- their rulers. The, the, when you talk about the judges at the beginning, let's talk about the book. You go back to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 2 is the reference. And he's talking about they're going to administer. The 12 apostles are not just going to be condemning the 12 tribes. They're going to be administering. They're going to be leading them in carrying out their function in the earth. Well, that's exactly what, what judging the angels is about. It's not about they're going to stand in front of me and I'm going to condemn them. It's that, we're, that, that there are, are, the saints are going to administer the, the affairs. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the saints judge, and if, and if the world should be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that, that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So that, that, that's where the passage about judging the angels comes from. And again, it's not condemning them. Is If you're going to be responsible for administering the affairs of the angels and figuring out how to do things in the future, can't you take care of judging and administering things now. He's in the midst of a, they're having a dispute here at Corinth, and they're, instead of figuring it out among themselves, they're going off to the unbelievers to let them figure it out, and he's rebuking them for it. So judging the angels, it's a misunderstanding to, to think, well, we're going to be busy judging the angels, but what do we do after that? There's not going to be an after that. <laughs> You're going to be involved in administering the judgment, of the, the, the program of God. Uh, come back with me to Psalm 130 just for a second. Understand what angels do. Psalm 130. I'll tell you what, make it Psalm 103. That's why I can't find it. It's not in 30, it's 103. I'm looking at the wrong chapter. Psalm 103, 103, there it is. Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearken unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his souls, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. So what do angels do? They do God's commandments. They hearken to the voice of his word, his instructions, and they do the things that are his. In other words, the angels are out there doing the will of God. They're his instruments that are out carrying on his business. They get the Father's... And by the way, in John chapter 1, look there with me if you will. John chapter 1. Did you ever wonder about this verse in John chapter 1? Verse number... He's talking to Nathan, Nathaniel, verse 49. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi, Thou art the Son of God, thou art the the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? And thou thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open. He's on the earth. He's going to see heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. There's Christ sitting on the throne of his glory on the earth. The earth is the command center of the universe. This is the planet where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to put his throne and rule the universe from. That's the the, the idea about the heaven open and the the angels ascending and descending. 
That's out of Genesis chapter 28 when Jacob sees the, the ladder and the angels ascend. But notice they're not descending and ascending. They are ascending and descending. They're going out from the earth and coming back to the earth. Now why would they do that? Here's where the command center is. They get the word of God. They get the command. They get his pleasure. And then they go out and carry out the business. I'm just trying to say to you, angels aren't just floating around saying, hmm, what are we going to do today? Let's, well, I think we'll just play a harp and we'll sit on a cloud and see what happens. There is business, there is activity, there are commandments, there's God's business that they're carrying out. And they're going to be doing that all through, they're doing it now, and they're going to be doing it through the ages to come. And you and I, as members of the body of Christ, the purpose of the body of Christ, Israel will take care of, of the nations on the earth the purpose of the body of Christ is to have an administrative rulership over the angelic creation, that is, over the business being carried out in the heavens. So it isn't something that's going to take place at a moment. Judging angels is just like Israel, the 12, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It has to do with administering over the affairs that they're carrying out. Now, there's a lot of things in your Bible about heaven. When you begin to understand the things that are there, you begin to understand why you need an administration. Come with me to Revelation chapter 21. When you, when you study these things, uh, the first thing people do is say, well, you're taking it too literally. Well, there are figures of speech and, and so forth in the Bible that are just, you just read the Bible the way you read anything else in the sense that you give it the normal meanings. If the Bible is using a metaphor, well, then you can recognize when it's a metaphor. And a metaphor is a comparison. And if, if it's a simile, that's a comparison using like or as. Two of the greatest words in the Bible to understand is the like or as. But sometimes there's a metaphor that doesn't do that. But most of the time, when you read it, it can be just literal. And if it's literal and logical, just take it for what it says. So in Revelation chapter 21... And I saw a new heaven and new earth. Now you're back to the Genesis chapter 1 status. Not new heavens, but new heaven. So now we're back before everything's been resolved. The fall's been taken care of. Now we're the great white throne judgment's over. All the lost are cast in the lake of fire. Satan's there. Now we're going to go back to Genesis 1, verse 1. And I saw the heaven, a new heaven and new earth. And the first heaven and the, and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So there's, a, there, there's this city. The third heaven is that city where God dwells, where he manifests his person, where he manifests his presence. Now, try to follow me. I'll try to be clear if I can. The earth is a pattern. He tells you, you see things on the earth, then you can understand the, the second heaven. There's principalities, powers, mights, dominions. They function this way. Same terminology describes how they function. So now I understand how the, the heaven, the second heaven works because I know how the first heaven works. But then he's going to describe the third heaven to you. And when he describes the third heaven, he's going to describe it and say, you see this up here? That first heaven looks just like it. You know what a city is? Where'd that idea come from? You said the first one Cain built. You know where Cain got the idea? He didn't just dream that up. He was plagiarizing God's idea. You follow what I'm saying? The third heaven is the original. The earth, the environment of the earth, the activities on the earth, is an environment that is made after the image of the third heaven. If that's the case, and then the second heaven is made after the image of the first heaven, then what is it? You see how you can, if you can understand this, you, you, got, you got the activity going down here? So when you think about, well, what's, what's heaven like? What's the, one, of the, one of the studies in this thing is called um, looking around heaven. <laughs> and what I did is I spent an hour just going through the scripture, 
look, here's what heaven's going to look like. Here's the environment. You're going to be, listen, when you die and go to heaven, you're not going to die and go off into some expanse that you don't, you know, with some strange creatures. It's going to be a totally familiar environment because this environment is patterned after that one. That's why he calls it, I'll show you in a little while, he calls it home. Look with me at chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4. This stuff to me, I, you know, when I read this stuff, I go, whoa. And again, you, you have to take it literally, but I think that's okay. You can do that. Revelation chapter 4. Just think about this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. You know what a door is? The original door wasn't these doors. The original door, and if you have a door, you got a wall. Where did the original idea for that come from? Well, it wasn't some carpenter down here. Mario didn't just go hang some sheetrock and decide I'll make a door. That's God's concept, the construction concept. The door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, was as it were, the, were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and there was a, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. <laughs> when I read that, I think, you know, we use that term, the throne, sometimes for a little different reasons. <laughs> The king, the father, is sitting on the throne. It's a real thing. And he said unto me, and he that, that sat was to look upon as jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow around about the throne in the sight, of, the sight like an emerald. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 1, you'll see a picture of the appearance of the glory of God as he sat on that throne. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats were four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now think about that. You're in an environment in the third heaven, in the throne room of God, and there's people sitting there, creatures sitting there on, on seats, and they've got on their heads crowns of gold. In other words, there's gold. They're crowns. Now you know what those things are, but the things that you're seeing aren't the originals. The things there are the originals. What you see here is made after the image of what's there. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Now think about that. If you have a lamp of fire, you have to have combustible material to burn in an atmosphere that, that will be compatible for that. So when I read that, all of a sudden, if I'm thinking about what's it like there, I'm saying, wow, this is, a, this is a throne room with seats, people sitting on them, and they've got lamps that are burning, so there's got to be an atmosphere that can, is, is, is compatible with that. You follow what I'm saying? This stuff's real, and it's actual, real activity that's going on there. And so you have all these different things that, that are there. He says in verse number Seven, the first of the beast was like a lion. The second beast was like a calf. The third beast had the face as a man. And the fourth beast like an eagle. Now think about that. He said, you've got these four beasts, you've got these four faces. What do the four faces look like? A lion, a calf, a, 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 a man, and what's the other one? The eagle. It's like... You know what a legal eagle looks like? Yeah, that one looks like that eagle. Which one's the original? That one. That one looks like, you, you know what this one looks like? You know what a man, a calf, a lion, an eagle looks like? That one up there is the original one. This is the copy that you see down here. The point is that there, there are all these creatures that are there they're the originals. When you see things here, it's made after that. People ask me sometime, do dogs go to heaven? Well, you know, two-legged ones do. But the idea is there are all kind of, I don't know any dogs in the Bible that talk about heaven, 
but they're all kind of creatures in heaven, and the creatures that are here come as copies of what's there because that's the original. The environment here reflects what's going on there. Um, come with me over to chapter, hold on to chapter 4 and look over to chapter 19. Verse number 11. And thou saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and righteous to the judge to make war. And what does he do? He comes out of heaven. You know what there are in heaven? The horses. Verse number 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now think about that what you learn from that verse. There are horses in heaven that are composed in armies. You look at chapter 12, verse 7, it talks about Satan and his, his, his angels and Michael and his angels. Armies, combat forces in the angelic realm. You go back to 2 Kings chapter 2 when Elijah asked God to show uh, his servant into the angelic world and he sees on the, on the hills of Israel horses and chariots with their flesh made of fire. In the angelic realm. Now, if you have, I don't know if you, Ed and Sherry Yarber just spent a week out in Tucson at a dude ranch. Can you imagine Edward at a dude ranch? <laughs> and they're riding horses and they're putting stuff on, you know, showing you pictures of all that stuff. And they're, they're showing it to make you jealous. And I'm feeling sorry for them. You know, I think, I bet he was saddle sore every night. But people love horses. We have people here looking for land so they can have horses. Well, you know what you do with a horse? There's a lot of upkeep for a horse. They eat in one end and get rid of it at the other end indiscriminately. Chariots. Now, can you think about the activity necessary to keep up horses? Think about the activity necessary to have a chariot. Somebody had to, pro had to produce a thing. You don't just go, give me a chariot. Now, God can do that. But angels can't. But they can build them. They can use their creative genius to build a chariot, just like man has used his creative genius to build all the chariots sitting on the parking lot out there. You follow how that works? So when you read about these things, you see when he says there in verse 15, or verse 14, they followed him upon white horses, clean and fine linen, you know what linen is? Linen is a cloth that is made out of a flax plant. Somebody's got to grow the flax plant in heaven. Now, I'm taking it literal, but okay. It's okay with me. So there's a, there's a cultivating farming process. Brother Morris is happy now. <laughs> And not only do they grow the flax plant, they process it, produce cloth, and then sow it. There's, I'm just trying to say to you, there's, there's, there's activity, there's, there's life. And everything you read in your Bible about what's going on there is comparable to what's going on here because what's going on here is the replica of what's there. See, that's not the replica of here. Here's the replica of there. And the activities of life, nobody's just floating around on a cloud drinking mint julep, wondering when the next puff, next puff of breeze is going to come by. People think, oh, we, you know, all right, we, we're through judging angels. What are we going to do then? You're going to be so busy, you're not going to have time to sit down. You're not going to need to sit down anyway because you're not going to have that old body of flesh that you got now. But there's activity there's God's, there's the business of the Father in His creation. Come back with me to Psalm 70. I love this one. 7, 8. I think. I'll have to get there and make sure. When I work out of my head sometime, I'm out of my head. <laughs> Psalm 78. Yeah, here it is. Verse number twenty. Talking about Israel, verse number 24. 
when they were in the wilderness and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven, men that eat angels' food and sent them meat to the full. Notice he calls manna the corn of heaven. It's the product of the grain that's grown in heaven. Come with me over to Psalm 105. Psalm 105, verse number 40. The people asked, and he brought quail and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. Now, the bread of heaven, you have the corn, that's the grain. The bread, the grain's been cooked and processed and baked. There's activity. There's things that are being done. There are things that are being accomplished. And when I think about that, the corn and the bread, the linen and the, clo and the clothing, you remember that in the ages to come, he should, he should show forth the exceeding greatness, the, the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. And I've talked to you about that idea of the exceeding. Something that is exceeding is you've got it now, and this is wonderful, but the next one exceeds, it's better, it's more developed. Well, that's exactly what the business of heaven does. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 3. Get Proverbs 3 in one hand and Colossians chapter 1. Proverbs 3, verse number 19. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop down the dew. Notice those terms, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. It's by God's wisdom, his understanding, and knowledge that he created the heavens. When he put the heavens and the earth, he literally put his wisdom, his knowledge, and his understanding into creation. When he put man on the earth, he says, go out and, 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 subdue, and subdue it and have dominion over it. And literally what, man, what man's purpose was is to go out and take creation, look at it, figure it out, and then develop it, discover the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that God put into it, and then develop it and use the creative genius. The first job God gave man in Genesis chapter 2 was to look at the animal creation and name them. There's an intellectual process that God instilled into man for him to take the creation and to enhance it, to add to it, not to pervert it, but to take what's there and take it to the next level kind of thing. That exceeding greatness. In the ages to come, when sin has been de dealt with, and we're left to to do exactly what God intended creation to do. You see, in creation, God has put the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that he sees the excellency of the greatness of the glory of his Son. And he, he has creation as a platform to demonstrate the glory, the excellence, the majesty that God the Father sees in His Son. It's a platform just to honor in whom, in, the one in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the enhancement, the using of, of creation that way is designed for that purpose. He calls it paradise, that third heaven. Paradise is a garden. You grow things in a garden. <laughs> Where do you put man? In a garden. Why? Because that's the thing you do. And in the garden... You grow the fruit, you grow the peach, and the peach is wonderful. But then you say, well, you know, if I, that peach is that good, maybe if I sliced it up, put some sugar on it, it would be even better. And peaches are good, but sugared up peaches, sliced up, let the juice on their own, that's even better. And then you say, well, if that's good and better, maybe if I took and mixed some flour and some brown sugar and some stuff in it and baked it up and made some cobbler, well, I love peaches, and I like sugared-up peaches, 
but I really like cobbler. You can look at me and tell that. <laughs> Good, exceeding, exceeding. Each development exceeding. So what, we're, what I'm talking about in creation, don't get the idea that there's nothing going on out there and the idea, I'm, where am I going to be floating around here hunting somebody to talk to? No. The angelic creation over which we're going to administer we're going to take the good, the, the, uh, the, psalm, the psalm said, they, they, they do his commandments. They adhere to his word and they do his good pleasure. And we're literally, our function as members of the body of Christ is to see that the will of God and the pleasure of the Father and the accomplishment of the Father's business is done in the heavenly places just like it's done for Israel on the earth. Look back with me at, at, at Ephesians chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 1 real quick. And by the way, that, that's why angels are often identified in the Bible as stars. They need, they, they're associated with, with light sources. So there are places, there are planets, there are locations in the heavenly places where concentrated effort will be taking place. When you watch, for example, we talk about Paul's ministry model. And one of the things when you study his ministry models, he targeted population centers. So it's not just a matter of floating around out there in the middle of nothing. It's the idea of gathering together, carrying on that business, and then using the heavens. Which, by the way, and I'll just make this statement for the, the record, the heavens are not as massive as NASA tells you they are. When they tell you that it's millions of light years and billions of planets, it's really not, at this moment, it's really not that big. It's big, but it's not that big. Once, those, once that restriction is taken off, well, then it'll take off. But God put it within a confined container at the moment to, where you have the ends of heaven in order to contain the rebellion of the adversary. But once you get to Revelation 21, you're back into Genesis 1-1 condition where the rebellion's been taken care of. Literally, you go from Genesis 1-2 to Revelation 20, and that's like the parenthesis in the eternal plan of God for his creation. But that's where redemption takes place. That's all free. The issue of what we're going to be doing, we're going to be administering, just as Israel administers the earth, we're going to be administering the government of the heavens. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his love when he hath loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So where is your position? You sit together in heavenly places. Your, 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 verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show forth the riches of his, the riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. Where is he going to show forth the riches of his grace in the ages to come? Well, verse 6 says, you're seated in heavenly places. It's in the heavenly places he's going to use the body of Christ to demonstrate the exceeding riches of his grace. Now, when he says you're seated with Christ, look back at chapter 1, verse number, nine, verse number 20. Talk about his great power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities, powers, might, and dominions. That's what we were just reading about in Colossians. So he set Christ as the head of all those positions of principalities and powers, above all principalities and powers, in might and dominion, and never name this name, not only in this world, but that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now notice what it says, made him head over all things to the church. It didn't say made him head over all the things for the church, it said to the it's to your advantage that he's the head of all those things because you're the, his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So he's made you, he's made, he made him to be the head over all those things and then he seated you there with him and you and I as members of the body of Christ share the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the heavenly government. Go back to Colossians chapter 1. Why did he talk about all the things you created in heaven and earth. Verse 17, all things, all, and he, before, he, he is before all things, all the 
dominions, principalities, thrones, and so forth in verse 16. He's before all those things, and by him all things consist. And he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Why did he make him the head of the church, the body of Christ? That in all things, all what things? The things in verse 16, that's in the context. He might have preeminence. Now, he doesn't need the body of Christ to be preeminent in the things in the earth. He's got an agency for that, the nation Israel. But Israel's confined to the earth. Psalm 115 says, you don't go to heaven, you're just down here. He did need an agency to be the head of the things in the heavens. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things. Now the universalists come on and say, see, he's going he's to reconcile Satan. And he's going to reconcile. No, the all things is the things in verse number 16. The positions of thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. How do I know that? Because I read the rest of the verse. Whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. He said, you remember those things I told you back in verse 16? He's going, to be the, he's going to reconcile all of that through the blood of his cross. The instrumentality for the earth, Israel, the instrumentality of the heavens, for us, the body of Christ. But when you're doing it, you're not just going to be... If he takes Israel and he says, I'm going to give you authority over the, the cities of the earth, and you're going to administer my, my... If you have authority over a city, think about that. You're not just telling people what to do all the time. You're figuring out how to accomplish those things. One of the things going on in the city, a big city like Chicago, right now they're trying to get the vaccines out. Well, you know, if it wasn't for Trump, there wouldn't be any vaccines, but they, you know, they're mad at him. But these guys got the vaccines, and they can't get them to people. There is an administrative problem to be solved. Who do you look to solve it? You have people in positions to do that. You have people in positions of, gov of, of administering. And there is a whole network of things that have to be done to solve those things. And it's amazing, you know, when you, when you look, even if everybody's cooperating, <laughs> instead of jockeying for position like human government does, there's all kinds of things that need to be accomplished. And there's all kinds of jobs that need to be done organizations that need to be put in place. And then when you do it, then there's a more efficient. Have you ever seen efficiency experts? I used to have a friend in Alabama. He was an economist, a government economist. He said, I'm the guy that everybody hates because they send me to an office, a government office, and they want me to make it more efficient. And he said, I walk in the first day, you, you, you get your job and you're an E-whatever because you administer 20 people. Okay, now you administer 15. Well, I just cut your pay, your, your status, but I increased your proficiency by about 15%. He said the way you increase the proficiency of a bureaucracy is you eliminate the number of people that have to handle a piece of paper. <laughs> and you make it more efficient. Okay, I, I got that. But that goes against the benefits of the administrators because you know they get paid by overseeing more people. There's all kind of things. You've got something working. Somebody comes, I said, I can make it work better. It's good. I can make it more better. It's good. Now it's exceeding good. And there's this constant growing of that kind of thing. Now look with me at Colossians chapter 1, verse number 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with what? the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You remember Proverbs 3? How did he create the universe? Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. He said, Paul said, I want you as a member of the body of Christ to be filled with spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding, so that you can fun function in the spiritual world. You can take... Life, creation, and make it exceeding. Now come with me, if you will. Hold on to that. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
and get 1 Corinthians 15. Mention the angels and the stars. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 39. Talking about the resurrection. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another of flesh of beasts, another flesh of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. So there are going to be bodies that function in the heavens and bodies that function on the earth. If you look down at verse number 44, your body is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. Verse 45, so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam, that's Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that which is not first is spiritual, but that which is natural and after that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man, the Lord from heaven, as the, is the earthy, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they that are heavenly. When you're resurrected, you're going to get a body made in the image of the heavenly. As we have borne the image of the, of the earthy, verse 49, so shall we also bear the image of the heavenly. So you're going to get a resurrection body that bears the image of the celestial bodies. Verse number 40, there's a celestial body and a body, there's a resurrection body. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. For there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. In your resurrection body, you're not all going to be the same. You'll have the same body. But there's, there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. And they differ in glory. They differ in the ability to shine forth the glory of God. And in your resurrection body, there's going to be that various statuses. Principalities, powers, mights, dominions, thrones, every name this name. The way that's determined is what Colossians 1 verse 9 is talking about. When you, The capacity you have to be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that's exactly what 2 Corinthians 5 is talking about. People talk about the judgment seat of Christ. I, I get, I've been getting emails from this guy. He's, he's either in New Zealand or Australia, somewhere out on the other side of the world. And he, he writes to me and he calls me all kind of nasty names because he says, you just think your old filthy, dirty, rotten flesh is going to get you some position. In the, your dirty, rotten, filthy flesh isn't going to get you anything. But we're not talking about your dirty, rotten, filthy flesh. We're talking about Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the capacity you learn, the amount of the ability you have to be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that capacity of understanding who you are and what God's doing, if angels are going to do His will, follow His word, and accomplish what pleases Him, your ability to understand that and comprehend that is going to enhance and, and determine your ability to serve. It has nothing to do with you. You, it's all to do with Him. And that's what 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 is about. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Not to be condemned. Hold your hand and look back at chapter 4. Make it 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And here's a passage of Scripture that for... Almost all of my Christian life has been a, been a very living thing in my mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. When you think about me, think about me that way, Paul says. Moreover, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. It's not a suggestion, it's a requirement. But for me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not thereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Paul said, look, I have, my, my responsibility is to be faithful as a steward of the mysteries of God. And I don't care what you think about it. 
I don't even care what I think about it because I can't figure out whether I am or not. You know, when you really know yourself, the hardest thing it is to do is evaluate yourself correctly. Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You'll think, oh, I'm just doing this for God, and, and, and your heart will say, yeah, 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 and it won't be that at all. Let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Every time I see somebody, I say, well, we're godly, we're do I think, better watch out, dude. And Paul said, I don't even worry. I'm just doing, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm doing all I can do to be faithful. And then the Lord's going to have to decide how good I did at it. Now, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. So when's the time the Lord's going to set this thing, this judgment out? When the Lord comes, who will both, both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Okay, that's the things you didn't want brought out. And shall make manifest the counsels of the heart. All of your motives. That you don't know whether, you, you know, the, the, I've said to you many times, the closer you get to the light, the better you see the dirt. You never know all your motives. And when you do know them, if you really know them, you know they're mixed at best. And then shall every man have praise of God. When he decides what's, what's left after he's cleaned away the dross, then there's something praise. You know what's praiseworthy? What Christ did in you. All the stuff you did, just what's the chaff to the wheat? Now look back at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This has nothing to do with your sins. Your sins are already taken care of at the cross. This has nothing to do with your shortcomings and your failures and all that. All that's taken care of, put under the blood. This has to do with the responsibility you had to be faithful. Every, and every one of us should receive the things done in his body. There's a strange idea. People say that that body there is the body of Christ. That's not the body of Christ. That's your body. So it's being talked about the whole passage here. What's being done? Who lives in your body? You do. This, that thing in Colossians 1 that you'd be filled with all the knowledge of His will, that is in your inner man. You're going to drop your flesh and your inner man's going to go to be, go to be with the Lord in a new body. So what he's talking about is what's happening inside. What, what's the, how much are you filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding? How good of a capacity, how much of a capacity have you developed to be able to do what Philippians 1 says? Hold your hand here and look at Philippians 1. This, this is such a great passage. Philippians 1 verse 9. That I may pray, this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Why? That you may approve things that are excellent. Why? That you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. You see that? He said, I want you to have the capacity, growing capacity, Grow in knowledge and judgment. Fill with knowledge that can discern things so you can approve things that are excellent. Not things that are good, that, that are sinful and not sinful. I have no, no problem discerning that. <clears throat> Something, the thing that's excellent is the thing of greater value. So you have the ability to look at life and say, this is of more value than that is. That comes with experience. Applying the doctrine. That comes with growing and comes with maturity. This is how Paul prays for mature believers. That you would grow in that spiritual capacity in your inner man. You're filled with knowledge and, uh, and, and of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That gives you the ability to pr approve things that are excellent so that you're without offense in the day of Christ. So that when he appears and he evaluates your life, in the sense of 1 Corinthians 4, there's nothing. 2 Corinthians says, 
you receive the things done in your body according that he has done, whether it be good or bad. The good he rewards, the bad does away with. Yeah. Now, that gives you a capacity to take a thing and see the thing that's of greater value. And you go into your function in the heavenly places, the Father will assign it to you, and your job is going to be to administer. Maybe you're going to be administering a farm. I hope I'm not because I'm not good at farming. My wife's talking about the lilies that the, we, we plant, she planted in the, in the bedroom. In the snow, they're, they're, they're up about an inch. She's got a, a De- what is that, a December cactus? Christmas cactus. It's blooming. Didn't bloom in November and Christmas. Anything we do with horticulture, is either, it either dies or it's backwards. So I'm not going to qualify for farming. Maybe I can help administer a library or something. Your capacities, you need to be fit. But there's all kind of activity. I'm trying to set you in the head. Listen, the environment of heaven is the environment he's put down here. So that when he brings his presence down here, it's not in a strange territory. And it won't be strange to us that he's here with us in his universe. So... What are you going to be doing? You're not going to be living in a mansion. I don't know what you'll be living in. doesn't tell you. He never tells you what angels live in. So there's a lot of things you don't know. But you're not just going to be bouncing around out there like, like in a pinball machine, bouncing from star to star. You're going to be responsible, carrying out business, the business of heaven, the, the commandments of the Lord, the Word of God, and His pleasure in the heavenly places, in the angelic world. That's, the whole purpose of that is to demonstrate the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's another subject to, to study about when we talk about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you demonstrate the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, the exceeding riches of His glory, every age, you're going to be involved in making it bigger and better and more advanced than it was in the past. You're going to take more out of creation and see His glory in it and how it advances, how it works. Because it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all about the glory that the, the glory the Father has ha, 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 and, and, and the, the, the way the Father cherishes Him and the, His creative genius that He's placed in creation as the stage to honor and glorify his son. And our job in the ages to come is going to be the, to show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness. Look at you and look what he's done to take you and transform you into the one that administers these things. Bunch of old dumb, gen, dumb idol worshiping pagan Gentiles. Didn't know anything. Didn't want to know anything. And he saved you by his grace and infused you with his wisdom infused you with his son and then he uses you to glorify him now if that doesn't tell you that right now ought to count for you nothing does when you're living in life right now and you're trying to figure out how to manage things and work through things instead of pulling your hair out and saying oh I don't know what God's letting me go through this for remember what Paul says in Galatians 4 I travail in birth again my little children I travail in birth again that Christ might be formed in you. And you're learning to think like he thinks so that you can do the Father's business in the ages to come. Okay? Tom says we've got to quit, so we'll quit. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you that it genuinely, truly is forever all about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.